Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, greetings to President Salave, Marta Moret, and all of you. And welcome to this year's Tanner Lectures at Yale University, hosted by the Whitney Humanities Center. My name is Gary Tomlinson. I am the director of the Whitney. And one of the privileges and pleasures of the Whitney director's position is to advise President Salave in the choice of Tanner lecturers. And this brings me into contact with the speakers well before they arrive on campus. In the course of this, of, of my email exchange, Professor Rosie Bredanti was kind enough to share with me the text of her lectures, and I know, I've had a preview in other words, and I know that we're all in for a lively, searching, challenging intellectual treat today, tomorrow, and Friday. But before getting into this, I want first to say a few words about the Tanner Lectures on Human Values. These were established by the American scholar, industrialist, and philanthropist, Obert Clark Tanner and his wife, Grace Tanner, for many years a professor at the University of Utah and a scholar of the New Testament, educated at Harvard, Stanford. Tanner also founded in 1927, early in his adulthood, a jewelry company in Salt Lake City. The company later expanded into broad areas of human resource consulting and employee recognition programs, trophies in short. And it is on this base that the Tanner Foundation and Obert and Grace Tanner's philanthropic efforts are to this day built. These efforts include the Tanner lectures, uh, lectures at Yale and at a number of other universities in the United States, Britain, and beyond. The purpose Obert Tanner envisaged for the Tanner lectures is to advance and reflect upon, upon scholarly and scientific learning relating to human values. In creating the lectureships, Professor Tanner knowingly left this purview very broad. He wrote, I see these lectures simply as a search for a better understanding of human behavior and human values. This understanding may be pursued for its own intrinsic worth, but it may also eventually have practical consequences for the quality of personal and social life. Appointment as a Tanner lecturer is a recognition of uncommon achievement and outstanding abilities in the area of human values and studies. The lecturers, as Tanner saw them, could come from many fields and walks of life, the sciences, the creative arts, and the learned professions, or indeed from leadership in public or private affairs, and above all, from philosophy, religion, and the other humanities. The lectureships are international and intercultural and are meant to transcend ethnic, national, religious, and ideological distinctions. At Yale, as I've said, Tanner lecturers are selected by the president in cons consultation with the director and executive committee of the Whitney Humanities Center. We are indebted to Yale President Peter Salovey for his assistance in bringing today's speaker to us, and we're delighted to welcome Professor Rosie Bredanti from the University of Utrecht. About Professor Bredanti's achievements and the impact of her work, you'll hear more in a moment. But first, a few words about the Tanner events of the coming days. They will include, of course, Professor Bredanti's lectures today and tomorrow, each beginning at 5 o'clock. Immediately following today's lecture, there will be a reception down the hall behind you in room 108, straight down that hall. You're all invited. And after tomorrow's lecture, there will be an opportunity for the audience to, ask, to address questions to Professor Bredotti. On Friday morning, then, at 10.30, we will reconvene here for a roundtable conversation with Professor Bredotti and Yale faculty, uh, Yale faculty members Joanna Radin and Rudiger Kampa. Now it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium Moira Fratinger, Associate Professor in the Department of Comparative Literature here at Yale, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Professor Bredotti was my MA thesis advisor in the early 90s in Utrecht. In my North Atlantic workplaces, I am often told that my Italian Argentine upbringing make me speak with my hands, abuse italics, breathe in allegro rather than in the recommended moderato, exaggerate everything, gendered and racialized stereotypes that today I readily assume as I gesture con brio in search for the word to express in italics at least a flicker of the joy, the vibrant injection of life that I feel in introducing Professor Bredotti to you. For me, not only an Italian king of sorts, who, like any other Italian, had to have family in that offshore Italian colony that is my hometown, Buenos Aires, from where she once shot me the arrow question, why did you move to the States? This city is such an exuberant political chaos. 
but also, and most importantly, a female force of desiring life that I encountered at the entrance of my academic life. I was then in The Hague for an MA in Women and Development offered for citizens of Africa, Asia, and Latin America who, like me, worked in public policy for women. Our evenings were filled with criticism of northern epistemologies blindly applied to the South. But then I was sent to Professor Braidati, and things changed. Her respect for difference was genuine. Her politics of location were real. Our dialogues were radically embodied in, in the cultures we offered each other, and, the contagi and her contagious joy in sharing, in thinking with, was the display of teaching as a practice of freedom an echo of her own writing, which she sees, as I quote, reconnecting the readers to their own desires for freedom and resistance. In the most generous of exchanges, I received from her the gift of feminist epistemologies. Today, whenever someone tells me I have transformed their vision, I think of my mentors, such as Rosie Braidotti, a woman with a rare capacity to transform the lives of those around her. Born in Italy into an anti-fascist family, Professor Braidotti grew up in Australia, where she got her degree in philosophy from the Australian National University of Canberra in 1977. From there, she went on to get a PhD in philosophy at the Sorbonne in 1981. Among her professors were the likes of Michel Foucault, Jules Alleuse, Félix Ouattari, and feminist philosopher Lucie Rigaray, anti-humanist thinkers inspecting the, th the shreds of the human left behind by the surgical knives of those whom Foucault would call the three philosophers of suspicion, Freud, Nietzsche, Marx, and some Darwin smuggled in the trial, in the triad. I never asked Professor Braidotti what it must have meant to move from that anti-humanist environment to one of the most humanist countries I know of, the Netherlands. A pioneer in the institutionalization of European women's studies, in 1988, she was appointed founding professor in women's studies at the University of Utrecht. From 95 to 2001, to 2005, she was the founding director of the Netherlands Research School of Women's Studies. She set up the Erasmus Teaching Network Noise in 93, the Socrates Thematic Network for Women's Studies Athena in 96, which received the Erasmus Prize from the European Commission in 2010, and the Marie Curie Early Stage Training Consortium in 2005. These achievements in networking feminist Europe were cited when she was honored with the Royal Knight Knighthood from Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands in 2005. For the last 15 years, she has been visiting professor in London, Bologna, Paris, Lausanne, Zurich, last year in Columbia University. From 2001 to 3, she was the Jean Monnet Chair Professor at the European University Institute in Florence. In 2005 and 6, she was Leverhulme Trust Visiting Professor at Birbert College. In 94, she was a Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. In 2006, she received a University Medal from the Polish University of Lodz. She was awarded honorary degrees in philosophy from Helsinki University in 2007 and Linköping University in Sweden in 2013. In 2009, she was elected honorary fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities and in 2014, member of the Academia Europea. Currently, she is distinguished university professor at the University of Utrecht and founding director of their center, of their center for the humanities. Often described as continental philosophy, her work has appeared in more than 20 languages. But cartographer as of contemporary ideas that she is, hers is a rhizomatic critical practice. She would say nomadic, perhaps. She navigates the in-between rather than the always fetishized origin of disciplines. She scavenges for productive zones of contact among social, political, gender, and feminist theory, race and ethnicity studies, animal biogenetic, cybernetic and environmental studies, post-colonial and economic theory, media and art history. She inhabits these intersections understanding that any intellectual practice is both political and artistic at once. And because her understanding is an acknowledgement, it comes with action. She collaborates globally with all kinds of institutions and she ceaselessly acts upon what she calls her enlightenment moment, advancing women in society. Recently, she established the Rosanna Fund to offer financial help to young female researchers. Professor Bredotti's interdisciplinary work started as a feminist philosophical history of the concept of difference and of sexual difference in particular, the latter too often lost in translation in the Anglophone Feminist Academy, more based on the concept of gender. Coming to term, coining the term feminist neo-materialism, 
she developed a genealogy of difference in positive terms, not as opposition, complement, or negative of the notion of sameness. The project began with her 1991, 1991 book, Patterns of Dissonance, an essay on women in contemporary French philosophy, and it was further developed into a feminist philosophy of nomadic subjectivity in many books, of which I want to mention three. Nomadic Subjects, Embodied and Embodiment and Difference in Contemporary Feminist Theory, 94, Metamorphosis Toward a Materialist Theory of Becoming, 2002, Transpositions on Nomadic Ethics, 2006. Her critique of Western productions of difference include all forms of binary oppositions and is inflected by a return to Spinoza's monism as the ground for an affirmative ethico-political project of sex difference. As a theorist of, theorist of embodied subjectivity, she could not not have engaged the current turn to the material that we anxiously breathe after the explosion of the so-called post-human turn and the Anthropocene. She had already engaged the technocognitive structure of advanced global capitalism in two co-authored volumes, Woman, Women, the Environment and Sustainable Development in 94, and Feminist Confrontations with Science, Medicine and Cyberspace in 96. The urgency of assessing a politics of difference amidst the, trans the transmutations of the capitalist present and, the, and especially its massive production of disposable forms of life lies at the core of her nomadic thinking in her latest book, The Posthuman, from 2013. This is the topic of her talks at Yale. Please join me with Brio in welcoming Professor Rosie Braidotti to our community. Can I possibly live up to that? <laughs> it is an enormous honor to be here. Thank you, President Salovey, Professor Tomlinson, dear Moira, for this amazing opportunity. I've been awake for weeks um, uh, dreaming of this moment. So, part one, memoirs of a posthumanist. Discussions about the human, and more specifically, what constitutes the basic unit of reference to define what counts as human are just not what they used to be. For instance, the question, what is human about the humanities, is not one that we were accustomed to asking. The human, whatever that may be, is that which we used to take for granted in order to do what we do in the humanities. And yet, over the last 30 years, we have witnessed the exposure, implosion and explosion of the implicit assumptions, images, and representations of that human. The terminological exuberance is telling. Notions circulating currently include the non-human, the inhuman, the post-anthropocentric, the neo-anthropocentric, various metamorphic entities and metamorphic zones, post-human personhood, make human, the new human, the a-human, the multi-species, the trans-species, and since 2003, we even already have a post-humanist manifesto. My aim in these lectures is to argue the case for the posthuman condition, pointing out its defining structures and key ideas. I will defend it as an affirmative condition, not as a terminal crisis, with special emphasis on the qualitative aspects of the condition. Today, I will define the main feature of the formation of the subject. You will find the subjectivity and formation of the subject is really what I'm zooming in on. We propose an ethics for the posthuman predicament. I will insist on the definition of the posthuman as our historical condition, not some future dystopia. My disagreement with the transhumanists couldn't be clearer. It's right here, it's right now, it's our historical condition. Tomorrow I will work out the implication of the posthuman ethical subject for the practice of the humanities in the 21st century. And in passing, of course, I will address the unfinished business of theory in general, and French theory in particular, and how it impacts on the posthuman moment. I will offer a cartography. Am I doing this right? Um, I'm not very good at these things. Um, uh, I, I will offer a cartography and a nomadic. There you go. 
an anomalic crossing. I must remember to click this whole point of this. But first, a few words about the title of today's lecture. Why memoirs? I chose memoirs to stress, of course, the narrative angle, but also to establish from the outset my credentials as a genealogical new materialist thinker. For me, philosophy starts off with embedded and embodied partial and hence accountable cartographies of complex intellectual and social phenomena. It is less of an intellectual biography than the account of a nomadic crossing, a journey across texts, teachers, and traditions. The fact that I studied with Foucault, Rigueret, Deleuze in Paris back in the 1980s when most of you weren't even born does play a role. And I still feel deep respect and loyalty for my teachers who belong to the tradition of French materialism. Knowing, however, that French theory is an exquisitely American invention and that Yale played such a central role in it, I want to revisit it through a different spectrum, bodily materialism. French bodily materialism is also known as the line of imminence, which runs through Spinoza, Foucault, Nietzsche, Foucault, Deleuze, as opposed to the line of transcendence, which runs through Kant, Derrida, Levinas. Both lines interrogate critically the German philosophical tradition. To make sense of the posthuman condition, I argue for new materialism and nomadic subjectivity that I revisit with the feminist politics of location. <laughs> Hope that the slides connect. I'm not very astute. Yes. Um, with the feminist political vocation, which is a, a method and a notion of embodiment, the trust, the lived experience, and I take it as the original, both historical and political, manifestation of the imminence of real life experience of a corporeal or sensible form of empiricism. I think the connection between imminence and a different empiricism is one of the great contributions of the neo-materialist line of feminist philosophy. Feminist theories emphasizes the situated and accountable nature of knowledge, allowing for the production of multi-layered epistemic and ethical accounts of one's locations. Locations are both spatial geopolitical, ecosophical, ecological, but also temporal. Locations are about historical memories, genealogical forms of belonging, and locations do matter. In order to understand the complexity and multilayeredness of the present, we need to start from the world. From there, I will trace the affirmative aspects of my philosophical approach. Not deference to textual authority, just relay points, generative connections, and productive zigzagging nomadic thought. I will add to the spatial elements a time factor. The present is not a static uh, block, but a flow pointing in multiple direction. As nomadic subject in process, in perpetual becoming, thinking about the present confronts, but also exceeds the immediate conditions we inhabit. So I would invite you to follow Deleuze on this. Um, why am I going backwards? Yeah. Uh, I will invite you to follow Deleuze here and think of the posthuman present as both the record of what we're ceasing to be and the seed of what we're in the process of becoming, both the actual and the virtual. This distinction is crucial for both of my lectures and I will keep returning to it. It's not a binary opposition, but the simultaneous occurrence of multi-directional processes. It's about complexity. In attempting to describe the predicament we are in, the best we can do is to speak in the future past, the future anterior. It will have been the best of times and the worst of times, but it will have been our time, although we were only passing through. Memoirs of the present, then. The first feature of the human predicament I want to point out is the context of the Anthropocene the geological time when humans are having a lasting and rather negative effect upon the planet's health and sustainability. This impact is multi-layered and it triggers unprecedented problems of an environmental, socio-economic, as well as affective and psychic character. The posthuman condition, however, includes but exceeds the specific Anthropocene, which is a controversial but also rather popular term in the scientific community. The issue of the Anthropocene is compounded by the combination of fast technological advances on the one hand and the exacerbation of economic and social inequalities on the other. 
making for a multifaceted and conflict-ridden landscape, in some ways, just referring to the Anthropocene is just not enough. For one thing, Einstein taught us a long time ago that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used to create them in the first place. New notions and terms are needed to address the constituencies and configurations of the present and to map future directions. We need more conceptual creativity, more theory rather than less, a renewed trust in the cognitive and political importance of the imagination. Besides, even as a relative neologism, the Anthropocene has already become just another meme. And we have now a whole series of terms sprawling up. And, uh, the Capitalocene, the Cthulocene, if you can pronounce it, Anthropocene, the Plasticine, the Plantation scene, Misanthropocene, and please, if you find some more, send them. The terminological vitality reflects both the excitement and the exasperation involved in accounting for the posthumous predicament within the anthropocenic frame. I propose, therefore, to look more broadly, widen the picture, and my focus through the reading of the posthuman will be subjectivity. What kind of subjects are we becoming in this particular frame? In order to approach this question with some degree of complexity, let me show you some pictures that tell the story starting from the state of our so-called, is there more? Uh, <laughs> continue. I tell you, they keep on sprawling. It's the rhizomic growth, unstoppable. The state of our so-called natural order. In the, in the Netherlands, that's how we produce food. To say that nature cultures today are fully integrated into a technological apparatus that maximizes profit is stating the obvious. But coming to terms psychically, socially, and ethically with that statement is a problem of an altogether different order and scale. Eco-critics are writing eco elegiac text to define our changing relationship to this techno-natural cultural continuum in which we live. Others speak more bluntly of eco-horror. In any case, the response is effective, and these powerful effects call out for new languages. What do you call that haunting feeling of ecological memories of the landscapes of your youth now transfigured by violent developments? Eco-nostalgia? Remembrance of trees past? <laughs> Geophysical semiotics? Portraits of a young wasteland? <laughs> Colonial transfigurations? Scar wars? And how should we describe that sinking feeling at the thought of the unsustainability of our future? Post-anthropocentric nausea, extinction attraction syndrome, terrestrial delirium, global obscenities overload, no country for any human? <laughs> this affective dimension cannot be separated from theoretical considerations. The Anthropocene is not taking place in a void but within the frame of cognitive and biogenetic advanced capitalism in media and information societies. What constitutes capital value today is the informational power of living matter itself, its imminent qualities and self-organizing capacity, which enhances the ability to generate profits from the scientific and economic comprehension of all that lives. Biopiracy is the norm. That creates as many problems as it solves, particularly if you broaden the picture to include the issue of subjectivity. Thus, these greenhouses may look like moon stations, but their produce is mostly picked by unregistered migrants who move from one site to another during the harvest season, constituting the proletariat of today, economic fodder vulnerable to widespread vilification and xenophobic rejection disposable bodies, invisible but indispensable. Moreover, our cultures move even beyond this biopiracy and its global proletariat onto more advanced mastery of living matter through synthetic biology, stem cell research, nanotechnology, gene editing, robotics, bioengineering, etc. Today, we recreate lifelines by code of a biogenetic and informational na uh, nature. Writing and editing code is what we do. 
Technological mediation is our second nature, from de-extinction to genetically modified food, Facebook and WikiLeaks. Our universities are in the middle of these phenomenal and exciting developments. We are motors of cognitive capitalism. Let me give you an example that I love. Artificial meat was made in 2013 at Maastricht University in the Netherlands from real meat stem cells grown in a lab and mixed with calf serum. The first prototype cost $325,000. But by now, the prices drop just to over $11 for one synthetic burger. The neural part of our human's interaction with synthetic meat is not up to scratch, but the proteins are in place. We should be cheering, particularly the vegetarians. So why those slightly disgusted faces? <laughs> what are we missing? Now the meat has emancipated itself from bound organisms. <laughs> Bio-nostalgia? What this tells us again is something about the complexity of our emotional responses to the posthuman, but also the capitalization of living matter and how important it is to our political economy. Life generates surplus profits. Informational data is true capital today. Knowledge about the vital power of meta gets transposed into data banks, and data mining is what knowledge production to a very large extent is all about. This has implication for posthumous subjectivity as well. The paradoxical result of mining the basic codes of life itself is that it induces, if not the actual erasure, at least the blurring of the categorical distinctions between the human and other species when it comes to profiting from them. Seeds, cells, plants, animal, bacteria, viruses fit into the logic of commodification alongside various specimens of humanity, producing a functional form of post-anthropocentrism that spuriously unify all species under the imperative of the market economy. The excesses of the capitalocene threaten the uniqueness of Homo universalis and anthropos, as well as the sustainability of the planet as a whole. The position of both the human and non-human is dislocated along multiple axes within this advanced and yet brutal post-human landscape. This internally divided picture becomes even sharper if we look specifically at the dispossessed. The inhuman is a significant component of the post-human predicament. And the contemporary world has more than its fair share of cruelty to account for. The brutality of new power relations has established a necropolitical mode of governing which targets not only the management of the living, but also multiple practices of managed decline and dying. Consider the generalized material destruction of human bodies, population, and the environment through the industrial scale warfare led by drones and other unmanned post-human vehicles. Think of the global effects of migration as a result of dispossession, expulsion, and terror. The refugee camps and other zones of detention are multiplying, as are our militarized borders and our humanitarian interventions. Whole sections of humanity are downgraded to the status of infrahumans, extraterritorial, like the refugees trying to cross the solid sea that is the Mediterranean, but now turning into a liquid grave. These are the extraterrestrial alien others not meant to be here to stay. These are the reasons why I want to foreground the question of the subject and work out what the posthuman condition may mean also for our self-understanding. The posthuman requires serious power analysis. Let it be clear, therefore, that far from marking the extinction or the impoverishment of the human, the posthuman condition is a way of reconstituting the human for some even a return to some form of neo-humanism coupled with enhancement and other mode of participation in the posthuman turn. For others, it's about a downsizing of human arrogance coupled with the acknowledgement of solidarity with multiple others. There are many dynamics of subject formation coming into being in this posthuman conjunction as a result of the dislocation of the grounds on which we used to compose and experience the old human. I will return to subjectivity because that's the main theme, but for now let me address another aspect of the problem. The posthuman predicament is constructed around a major paradox that you, I think you're all familiar with, namely 
There is widespread production of knowledge and speculation, both in the academy and in society, about a category, the human, at the very time when that category has lost all consensus and self-evidence. I hope you will have noticed, and here comes the future past again, that the argument I am building is gradually constructing an embattled and endangered people. Uh, we are in this together kind of people that are vulnerable because of the times, internally fractured and not at all the same, let alone universal, but are also determined to adopt a critical and creative stance towards the great opportunities but also the great injustices and threats of the present. The paradox at work here is the simultaneous over an exposure and evanescence of the human in post-human discourses and practices. The category emerges as urgent as it enters a terminal crisis. It does not even hold as a category anymore, other than as an expression of anxiety and concern. Think, for example, of the by now classical, sorry, this one. I always forget them. Um, the classical posthumanist example of Foucault's image of the face of man on the sand by the seashore, which is gradually erased by the waves of history. Is it about extinction or renewal? Never mind the social constructivist discussion. What matters here is how Foucault's genealogical method grapples with this conceptual paradox. It is at the moment of its dissolution that man becomes thinkable. And as such, it emerged as a present concern. Up until that moment, it had not surfaced to the critical eye because it functioned as an implicit normative notion. As I said at the beginning, we were not trained to question directly the identity of the human in the humanities. It was just not a question. It had to be recast and reformatted within the protocols and methods of each humanities discipline when it conventionally falls into a pattern of dualistic oppositions that define the human mostly, but what it is not. Mula John Mularke Whitley observes, for instance, that the animal provides an index of death for Derrida, an index of life for Deleuze, an index of dehumanization for Gamben, and you can continue the sequence with all the others you know. The posthuman condition encourages us to move beyond <clears throat> these representational habits and the philosophical anthropocentrism they entail. We simply cannot start from the centrality of the human and to uphold the old dualities. But this acknowledgement does not necessarily throw us into the abyss of new bestiality or the terror of extinction. There has to be some other middle ground, some other milieu. This is where the conceptual distinction between the perception of what we are ceasing to be, that is to say, the present, as the actual, and that we're in the process of becoming the present as the unfolding of the virtual, offers critical and creative margins of intervention upon this, this paradox of simultaneous overexposure and evanescence of the human. This distinction between the present as the record of the past of the actual and the, the seed of what we're becoming opens up new spaces, the space of no coincidence between the given and the critique of the given. It's another kind of middle ground, another milieu, which points to the future, that is to say, to what we're capable of becoming in and out of what we're seizing to be, creative, vital, new materialism. If we take this approach, a number of consequences emerge. Firstly, there is no paradox in the simultaneous overexposure and non-existence of the human, because there is no linear time, but a thousand plateaus of possible becoming, each following its own multidirectional or rhizomic course. A non-linear temporality allows us to look into the details, do more detailed cartographies, respect the complexities of our embodied, embedded, relational and affective posthuman subjectivity. Secondly, there is no extinction survival binary, because posthuman nomadic thought is not about dialectical oppositions, either or, it's about immanent relations, and, and. By extension, this means that there is no justification for panic-stricken reinvention of a wounded but reunited humanity, a we that would be somehow in this together. We need more diversified and complex affective range. What we need, above all, is a specific form of complexity, proper to the humanities, which are the subtle, not the soft 
sciences. If we agree on anything today is the humanities as the subtle sciences. Thus I come to my first proposition. The proper subject of <coughs> uh, posthuman inquiry is a new subjective uh, and subject position. Uh, we are in this together, but we are not one kind of subject. Understood as a process of becoming, becoming other than the homo universalis of humanism and the anthropos of anthropocentrism in its own immanence and not in binary oppositional terms. Let me expand on this proposition and give you some examples to ground it. The posthuman is a convergence phenomenon unfolding at the intersection between posthumanism on the one hand and post anthropocentrism on the other. This convergence is producing a chain of theoretical, social, and political effects that is more than the sum of its parts and points to a qualitative leap in new conceptual directions. Before exploring further what kind of leap I would like us to take, let's have a look a little bit to how posthumanism and post anthropocentrism work. The fact that I don't consider them as logically following from each other is um, very important. I think it's a mark of the new materialist connection. Most Derridians would say that posthumanism and post anthropocentrism logically follow from each other. This is not my argument at all. Posthumanism proposes the philosophical critique of the Western humanist ideal of the man of reason the allegedly universal measure of all things, whereas post-anthropocentrism rests on the rejections of species hierarchy and human exceptionalism. If you look at the, at the scholarship, they come from really different areas um, of studies. Um, equally powerful discourses, but different traditions, and they, and they engender different political stances. Um, posthumanism drags us ba back to debates we may not want to revisit, uh, though I fear we can't completely avoid them, about the unfinished business of the French and postmodern critiques of the human, namely the quarrel with him. The homo universalis of the humanist human, uh, uh, universalism, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man. Let me just say this to avoid the polemic. While the philosophical post-structuralist generation develop its own critique of humanism, Multiple feminist waves, anti-racist activists and critical theorists, environmentalists, disability rights advocates, media activists, LBGT activists, always question the scope, the founding principles and the achievements of European humanism and its role in the project of Western modernity. Their criticism was twofold. Firstly, it targeted the unfulfilled promises of the Enlightenment while producing counter notion of the human and humanity in non-masculinist, non-Eurocentric terms. Secondly, they taught us that the human is not a neutral term, but rather a term that indexes access to specific uh, powers, values and norms, privileges and entitlements, rights and visibility. Critical questions about the limits of humanist um, universalism were raised from the 18th century onwards by Olympe de Gouges with her declaration of in the rights of women, and very much supporting the Enlightenment, but we're saying, well, thank you very much for those rights. Is my gender included in it? She fought, she campaigned, and she ended up under the guillotine. Toussaint Louverture, also 1719, attempted to apply the universal principles of equality to the status of slaves in the colonies, and abolished slavery, the Haiti Revolution, the French army comes in and squashes it. These critical voices set the agenda for movements that across time teach us that the fundamental social categories such as race, set, gender, social class, and sexual orientation function as markers of human normality. There are still key factors in policing access to something that we call humanity. And the extent to which the humanist ideal is a civilizational ideal is at the core of all the critiques that my teachers like Michel Foucault put at the center of um, the anti-enlightenment um, discourse. Um, this, the, the idea that the, the defining feature of the human is this reason, the, the, the pursuit of perfectibility through rational, moral, universal um, capacity. The boundless faith in that um, teleological rational progress idea um, uh, positions Europe as the cradle of that civilizing mission. So far, posthumanism. So I've kind of skirted a little bit the post-structuralist thing, though it is quite obvious that in confronting the legacy of the posthuman critique, we have to reopen that difficult chapter. Post-anthropocentrism, totally different stories. Um, uh, I, 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 I think as, as scholars in the humanities, 
we are fa fatally attracted to anthropomorphic object of studies when we are not belligerently anthropocentric. So we can't even begin to imagine that non-human entities could be the measure of all things. Post-anthropocentrism propels us forward to topics we may not feel a particular aptitude for. Animals, plants, cells, viruses, bacteria, algorithms. And yet, we need to think, as Virginia Woolf taught us. We need to go on thinking in spite of everything. So how do we go into this line of critique taking on the challenge? For one thing, we notice um, that, the, that the continuity between the postmodern and the posthuman also um, uh, expresses itself in intense irritation um, about the posthuman. The degree of virulent rejection of the posthuman really reminds me of the quarrels against the postmodern. Um, but we also know by now that the French poststructuralism is the preferred public scapegoat for all evils that befall us, so we can now be restful. I even wrote, an, I, very, I read a recent article on the connection between post-truth and post-modernism and the Financial Times. So thank God we have the French because we always blame them for everything. Um, <laughs> more broadly, apart from the irritation, the post in the sense of post anthropocentrism is getting some people really very worried. Habermas, Sloterdijk, Fukuyama, His Holiness, Pope Francis are all onto this displacement of the centrality of Anthropos. Um, uh, a lot of cognitive and moral panic. So let me repeat the question. How do we go about thinking along these complex and interwoven posthuman lines? Um, well, we need to have some courage and, and move beyond dualistic oppositions, embracing a different vision of what it means to think and what it means to be um, a thinking uh, subject. We need to connect critique to creativity and invent new ways of thinking. We need fundamental labs in theory in the humanities because we cannot solve the problems in the same language we use to create them in the first place. So we have here a change of the grounds, a change of paradigm, which is not just critical, but also affirmative. And I will give you some more example of this tomorrow. For now, the next step is to see what kind of ethics, what kind of values um, we could attach to this rather, is it desperate, is it brave, is it affirmative, is it the overdoses of neo-Spinozism through Deleuze, but the belief that through the line of imminence, we need a differential, embodied and embedded materialism that would allow us to belong and flow at the same time, remain constantly connected to a multitude of others, but find some meta-stability in the real world. There is here a connection, and I'm very grateful to Kate Stimson for pointing it out, between this mater differential materialism of the, of the French Spinozist and good old American pragmatism, um, notably the work of William James and John Dewey, um, very dear to Richard Rorty as well as Kate Stimson. It's a whole project, but I'll leave it on the side for now. Let's start from the monistic continuum of Zoe. <clears throat> the intertwined web of human and non-human living matter, as opposed to bios, which is a specific slice of material and discursive life traditionally reserved for anthropos. If thinking is acting in the world with a multitude of others, then we need to situate this ethical subject in the world relationally connected. The emphasis on eminence means <clears throat> that a posthuman subject the we are in this together, but we are not one and the same kind of subjects are imminent to, which means connected to the very conditions they're also critical of. The embodied relational nature of this technologically mediated, globally interlinked, and yet internally fractured subject rests on what I learned the most from Spinoza, which is ontological pacifism, trust in our shared intimacy with and knowledge of the world and our lived experience of it. That's the great advantage of the line of eminence. Differences here get constituted not oppositionally, but as internal modulation within a common meta. As my Spinoza's teacher, Genevieve Lloyd in Sydney puts it, for Spinoza, the ethical life consists in understanding ourselves as integral part of the totality of being. And because bodies are embrained and brains are embodied because matter is intelligent and self-organizing in a Spinoza's worldview. Um, part, we are interconnected to the totality of both thought and matter. What this means for our 
post-human thinkers is that we have the grounding to interact with the time. Deleuze would say to be worthy of our times in order to resist them. That is to say to differ from them, especially on their unjust and negative aspect. We need to detox from the poison of negative passion and affects, like resentment, envy, hatred, despair, but also sheer tedium. We have to labor towards a new kind of subject that is both immanent to the world, that is to say, crit confident about the world, but also critical of its injustices and negativity. A subject in process towards its singular becoming, which can only be actualized together. Well, what's posthuman about this return to Spinozism? Well, it's posthumanistic and post anthropocentric. It is materially embedded. It is supported by a vital new materialist philosophy of imminence, and it is driven by the ethics of joyful affirmation of what we're capable of becoming, the virtual. Posthuman subjects assume not only the material totality of things, all matter is one and self-organizing, but that also that this totality includes technological artifacts. The great advantage of Spinoza, Spinoza today would have been I think a programmer in his days, he was a technician making lenses. And he makes no distinction between objects that are made and objects that are born and bred, because an object is only a vector of forces. And you, you don't judge it by its origins, but what it's capable of doing, what kind of relation it's capable to modify. So we need here to connect, return to the notion of the posthuman subject that I gave you at the beginning, embodied, embedded, multilayered, relational. And we need to apply this to the vitality of contemporary technology. Zoe needs to embrace geo and techno bound egalitarianism, acknowledging that intelligence, thinking, and the capacity to produce knowledge is not the exclusive prerogative of humans, but is distributed across all living matter, self-organizing matter, and technological networks. This statement, which may seem self-evident for science studies scholars, anthropologists of science and technology, or environmentalists, is more indigestible for philosophers and other humanists. The transcendental nature of consciousness is something of, a, of, the, uh, of an order of a foundational principle. And to actually come across with the notion that thinking takes place everywhere and not only within the anthropomorphic subject is something of a nonsense or of a scandal um, or a sacrilege. But that is exactly what we need to do. Thinking is the stuff of the world. If by thinking we do not mean the despotic eye of transcendental consciousness, but the power, potentia, of embodied and embedded subjects, and to express the unrealized, that is to say, virtual potentialities. Obviously, we all have the capacity to relate, but we differ in what stuff we're actually made of, that is to say, in the degrees and, power, and, and force of our potentia. Zoe, geo, techno-bound, neo-materialism indeed. So thinking defining the sense of this relational and collaborative construction of sustainable ways of embracing a world that we're profoundly unhappy with is the task of producing adequate understanding of what is happening to us so that we can intersect productively with others. Thinking thus defined is what being alive feels like. Once this profound intimacy with life and living system, organical and technological, born and manufactured, bred and designed, is established, we have posthuman, all too human, vital materialist subjects embedded in the condition of their historicity, but also contained and also limited by the frame of what their embrained bodies can do. And guess what? The posthuman condition is such that the very factors that structure the subject are simultaneously booming on and crashing down. Now you may say, what's so new about boom and bust? Um, and the regular features of the American way of life and of life in general. What is new with the embrace in the posthuman condition is the scale, speed, and structure of the transformation. That is to say, of what is simultaneously ceasing to be and in the process of becoming. Computational networks functioning at posthuman speed have added a new dimension to the idea that thinking is not restrained, confined uh, to the uh, embrained organism. On the other hand, wherever you may care to look at the environment, the technology, the accumulation and polarization of wealth, 
the flows of mobility and the buildings of new walls and border, increased digital interactivity and the growth of xenophobia and racism. And whichever frame of understanding you may attempt to adopt to make sense of these convulsive, internally contradictory events, all thinking seems inadequate to the scale of the issues and the schizoid nature of their interaction and to the painful, glaring degrees of injustice, violence, the disrespect and the indignity of how we deal with each other and with the world today. Remember that reaching an adequate understanding of the condition of our bondage is Spinoza's definition not only of philosophy, but also of the ethical life, a life lived in the pursuit of the expression of our innermost essence. And this essence is the joyful affirmation of our freedom, our desire to endure and to persevere and to express what we're capable of doing, and with us, the rest of this planet. This ontological interconnectedness changes everything because the posthuman subject of the, post of the Anthropocene simply cannot afford, in view of their specific historical condition, to restrict the ethical life to bios, bios alone, or to anthropocentric life. Posthuman ethics is about reinventing the connection to non-human, inhuman, faster than human forces. This ecosophical dimension, as Guattari called it, resonates with the technosphere in a movement that pushes the quest for an ethics, not only to terrestrial and global, but also to cosmic dimensions. If the traditional ethical formula of the humanist subject was the contemplation of their own mortality, balanced by the prospect of the eternity of their rational soul, if the formula of postmodern subject was deep skepticism about the foundational robustness of any category, including that of subjectivity, if the post-nuclear subject's ethical, ethical formula is an extinction of their and other species, with a few notable and mostly loathsome exceptions, is a distinct possibility that ought to be avoided. And please notice that the Anthropocene has been officially dated from 1950, the, born of the, the dawn of the Manhattan Project. Then the ethical formula of posthuman subject may well have been to learn to think differently about what we're in the process of becoming. And what that difference really means is an enhancement of our relational capacity to elaborate adequate understanding of our interaction with all kind of matter at a time when our history and technology have revolutionized our understanding of what counts as matter and what matter can do in a multi-scale manner. Posthuman ethics is about the pursuit of the unre unrealized potential of complex assemblages of subjects at a time when the future seems narrow, to say the least. In order to provide a workable solution here, we need a lot of courage, um, a lot of bravery, a lot of experimentation, um, uh, confronting the fact that thinking is not the faculty of human, exit homo universalis, the anthropomorphic structures um, that we inhabit, our bodies, slightly outdated and slow and inert by comparison to synthetic life, exit anthropos. And at this particular point, inhuman rationalism, which is very popular with objects ontologists and other constituency, does not really do the job. It actually begs the question, because in order to provide workable solutions to these challenges, we need to compose new collaborative grounding to our ethical and political subjectivity, to our being in this together, knowing that being in this together does not flatten out the power differentials between us, and that we are not the same by all means. Moreover, that we are in this together kind of subject includes an array of non-human components, down to fungi and algorithms, plastic-coated seas and poison earth. All of that is what we are in together with. We posthuman people emerging from the humanities need to change how we think about thinking. We need to write collective memoirs of how things will have come to pass, how it will have come to this. In other words, we need to embrace the posthuman condition as our chance to develop together an adequate understanding of the mutation we are undergoing in all of its complex and confrontational aspects and labor together to construct a people who can hopefully steer the qualitative leap in an affirmative direction. 
posthuman subjects will have been all too human in that they are facing right here and now an inhuman present and possibly an ahuman future. Learning to think differently about what we do when, uh, when we think about the humans that we will have been enlists and requires the resources of the imagination, as I said before. Ultimately, it leads us to a need for a pra an ethical praxis that begins with the recomposition of a people. And the ethics of affirmation is the praxis that I propose, and I can summarize it because the time is at the premium, um, with a series of move. Um, uh, affirmation, in order to make sense, needs to be uh, de-psychologized here. It is not about feeling good and feeling happy. It's about increasing and enhancing our relational capacity. It's about modes of empowerment, um, looking at the uh, ability to see life as enduring, enduring as the ability to persist and persevere in what I would call processes of becoming. Um, and what this means for people like us is that we need to uh, say no to the unacceptable aspects of the present. We need to, to put a negative judgment, if you want to speak like a Kantian, uh, but I would not see it becoming ethical as applying moral rules and protocols, um, but rather as a process of transformation. Saying no to the unacceptable aspect of the present cuts both ways. It means I prefer not to, but it also means I desire otherwise. Ethical relations create possible worlds by mobilizing resources that had been untapped in the present, including our desire and imagination. We have to desire otherwise. Remember that desire in this conversation is ontological and not necessarily sexualized. We're looking at a rather metaphysical world system. So, so for ethics of affirmation and what is affirmative is whatever enhances and increases our ability to take in the world, to relate with the world even when it repels us. The ethical evil is equated with negative affects and what is negative about them is not a normative judgment but it is the effect of diminishing our power of relation, an effect of blockage um, that comes as a result of a blow and a shock, a trauma or just intense boredom, catatonia. I think catatonia describes us pretty good now. This ethics consists not in denying negativity, but working through the pain, activating it um, in order to move forward. Um, this, I would say, is the most post-identitarian moment of the ethics of affirmation. Um, uh, you don't index this process on an individualist notion of the subject, but keeping the complexity and the subtlety in mind, we connect it to the composition of a new subject. Uh, we are in this together relational subject, where the agents of that are not all human and not all organic. So I, in order not to seem like a pathological optimist, let me stress that the affirmative ethics is not about the avoidance of pain, it's another way of working through it, of transforming it. And uh, does not deny uh, the, the, uh, the conflict or pain, but reworks it in the direction of Spinoza. Deleuze reads Spinoza as a clinical treaty. It's about detoxing us, as I said before, cleansing us, uh, and he calls it the poison of negativity. Today there's so much negativity we can choose our um, metaphor. Uh, of course, repugnant and unbearable events do happen. Ethics consist in reworking them in the direction of positive relation. This is not lack of compassion, but rather an oversupply of it, aspiring to making the, together the condition for a collective overturning of the negative. Remember Nietzsche saying the critical uh, thought needs negativity, feeds on negativity. How about we disengage our critical thinking from that and connect it to affirmative creation of potential alternatives? Actually, a, a, a relationship of mutual specification guided by the joyful ethics of affirmation. We're in this together is the ethical formula par excellence, all the more so in the posthuman vital political economy of becoming. Um, and this is what I would like to propose as the foundational ethics for this posthuman assemblage, not lack but vital generative forces, um, uh, not uh, just a, an emphasis on moral intentionality by a becoming ethical together. It's what I would call a pragmatic ethics. Um, and these are the key terms um, of the ethics of affirmation, to be worthy of what happens to us, 
to, sh to increase our, our shared capacity to affect and to be affected, knowing that the we in, in, in question here includes um, uh, Zoe geo techno bound egalitarian relations, um, uh, post identitarian and runs against the spirit of identity loaded, consumeristic, obsessed capitalism and the commodification of life, which is the central core of our knowledge production system. This is the ethical platform to confront the challenges of our posthuman times in their achievements as well as their horror. Yes, we are in this together, but this togetherness is not given, it has to be constructed. We need to be ever mindful of the fact that the human never was a unitary term to begin with, but rather a term that indexes access to rights and entitlement. No amount of neo-Kantian universalism can conceal the fractures, the internal contradictions and external exclusions that have always composed a notion of the human. And leaving the question of the subject out of the posthuman picture altogether just begs the question. That's for Bruno Latour. In other words, being posthuman is not a mark of contempt for mankind. It rather expresses the belief that the human is its own overcoming because it is a relational entity that becomes in and with the world. I will have argued throughout this, throughout this lecture that the posthuman is our historical condition, which is multifaceted and, and affects all fields of human endeavor, operates at all scales of constitution of our multiple ecologies of becoming subject, and it inhabits multiple and internally contradictory temporalities. The posthuman predicament points to a change of paradigm, far from being uh, postmodernist or deconstructivist, it is materialist, pragmatic, and neo-foundationalist. The posthuman knowing subject is a complex assemblage of human and non-human, ecological, technological, planetary, and cosmic, giving and manufactured relations. It is inscribed in the power formation of the current phase of cognitive capitalism and ubiquitous mediation, biopiracy, necropolitics, and worldwide dispossession, expulsion, and migration. The posthuman subject need to develop an ethics that combines the recognition of our collective belonging to the totality of our monistic universe with respect for the structural differences and inequalities that compose our social existence and the desire to develop a collective ethics of becoming. However it may hurt, we need to inscribe the contemporary subject in the condition of their present predicament in order to transform it affirmatively. Posthuman subjects pursue an ethical praxis that entails this mix of human and non-humans. Uh, it is in a vital interconnection that is smart and self-organizing, but not chaotic. Everything starts with the composition of a people, a community that collectively recognizes that we are in this together, but we are not one and the same, but are driven by a collaborative, ethics of empowerment and formation and the co-construction of social horizons of hope for yet unrealized futures precisely when all hope seems lost. The next step of the argument will be that we, teachers and thinkers in the humanities, need to embrace the multiple opportunities offered by the posthuman condition while keeping up all the other competences we already have. And if the proper study of um, humanity used to be um, the proper study of mankind used to be men, and the proper study of uh, the humanity was the human. It seems to follow that the proper study of the posthuman condition is the posthuman knowing subject. This question contains the core of uh, my next lecture, where I will apply these ideas to the development of what I will insist in calling with pride and joy the subtle posthuman humanities in the 21st century. Thank you for your attention.